Hello, I'm in Selangor, Malaysia, and this is the museum of the Sultan of Selangor, which was oddly enough spelled Selangor by the British, apparently. Uh, that's a gift by the, um, either to or from the Chinese, and this is all going to be very interesting. Let's take a quick walk over here while I explain what I learned uh, from this really nice museum. Well, the first one is easy, the, the post office. You know, you always notice that when, you t when you're on a tour that they show you the post office because it's one of the nicest buildings in the neighborhood, um, almost anywhere you go, especially if it's a historical building. And that's because post offices back in the day, they used to do a lot more than just the mail. In this case, you know, we learned that you could actually have a savings account, um, you know, a way to save money. They really helped people save money and do a lot of other things. It wasn't just about this idea of being able to uh, send something or a postcard through the mail. Um, so the other issue here is just what was going on um, with colonization. And one thing that you see whenever you go to any, any of these palaces um, is just how decked out the sultan or the raja or the king is. And so let's go ahead and maybe discuss that very quickly. One of the things that is interesting, especially in Southeast Asia, is how the colonial powers came in. Uh, and despite fierce resistance, were able to export natural resources from this region, thereby enriching themselves and their empire. And there's a couple of ways that they did it. Even if they were, you know, even if, even if they were driven out, um, you know, you were in a position where, you know, you would be able to institute a blockade. So to the extent that a, a sultan here was courageous enough and competent enough to drive out the colonial army, the problem is it doesn't seem as if anyone had a viable navy or an armada. And so we see as we get closer and closer to more modern history, the importance of ships, of the navy, and also why you know the feared Spanish armada uh, was able to take over so much of the world. It wasn't necessarily based on the courage of the army. It very well could have been just the fact that if you had an advanced ship or advanced ships and you were able to eliminate that threat from the other side, or in other words, if you were in a position where the other side was unable to dislodge your ships, you were the potential victim of a blockade, which means that you would eventually starve. Um, and so as a result, even in Selangor, where the British were driven away initially, uh, they had to give up power and land and control of, of their natural resources because the British in installed a blockade. And so that's something that's really interesting about history. And of course, it, it tells you why the submarine was invented later on and why it was so powerful uh, and, and a game changer within warfare. And so we talk about that. What happened here, based on what I saw in the museum, is that the British came, and then what they did was they had the, the, the Sultan sign away essentially rights to the tin and other natural resources within his province. Uh, and so at the same time, the incentive for the king to sign was not only his life and his family's life, but also just the fact that he would be given control over the administrative duties of his region, such as marriages, you know, um, seals, um, court systems, the appointment of judges, and so on and so forth. But really, we could see very quickly that some colonial powers were mainly interested in just exporting uh, tin and other natural resources, maybe spices, if you're the Dutch in Indonesia, uh, back to the home country in order to further the, the empire. So that's something that's, that's not necessarily discussed in context very well. So even if you were able to have resistance at the local level on the ground, in almost no case in Southeast Asia, did anyone have a competent enough Navy in order to prevent a blockade. So a lot of what you hear about military history, a lot of what you hear um, is a bit false, falsely depicted, simply because it's, it, it's depicted in a way that maximizes the courage of the soldiers. When in fact, it's really, Again, the power of the Navy, which continues today to, to play an outsized role in the world just based on trade. Most trade is still done on the high seas. It's not done by the majority of it. It's not done by train or plane. Uh, it's still done by ship. And that is, again, a continuation of the advantages that ships had all over the world, particularly in 
the Straits of Malacca from 1511 onwards. So you can see very well, let's say, you know, if, if you are a Saudi Arabian or the Arab Empire, and you don't have a navy, but you have the best soldiers on the ground, the most courageous soldiers, it's not gonna help you um, at all, you know, if you don't have a competent navy, especially if you can be blockaded and, and locked in and starved to death or denied essential resources. Um, so that's key. And so a lot of this warfare is not about courage on the ground, it's about intelligence. And that's something that's really sort of lost on a lot of people who make movies about history and so on and so forth. Uh, there were a couple of um, interesting things, mistakes there that I, you know, that I just found amusing. One of them is that there is a clock um, from the from the UK that was probably a gift, and it, it's an older one with the very proper British attire. But the man had long hair, and so he's standing next to the, you know, leaning into the clock, clearly a male. Uh, but it was depicted as, you know, if you look at the translation, uh, whoever built the museum uh, thought it was a female because of the long hair that the male had um, in the clock. Um, you know, I'm trying to just sort of put things in context because that's such a difficult thing to do, especially today. And, you know, that was the, the main things that stood out to me uh, were just that potential for a blockade. But also, how do you pacify the sultan or the raja or the king once you begin the occupation? And in some places, like in Cambodia, uh, it, was, it was easy, right? It was drugs, opium. In Cambodia, you had both the, the French were giving the king as well as his potential successor or a competitor uh, about over 100 kilos of opium every year. So you start thinking about these things and you start making a lot more connections, right? You go to Hong Kong, um, you look at the, you know, the Boxer Rebellion, you look at the opium wars, and you start to see, well, wait a second, Maybe the Chinese didn't take a liking to the opium um, that was that may have been not necessarily forced upon them, but you know, <laughs> clearly something that would, you know, allow them to be comfortable with having signing, you know, having signed this document uh, that that again in almost every case caused the loss of natural resources uh, within the country, which meant that you're essentially exporting the value, the, the economic value, out of the country while giving the administrative burdens. You know, they're placing those burdens specifically on the king and the sultan and his, and his staff. Um, so that's something to think about. You know, how are these sultans placated? If the drugs didn't do it, then, of course, you had, since in, in every case you're, you're dealing with a male, um, I think so. Well, depending on where you are, um, not, I'm sure it's not in every case. But uh, to the extent that you were dealing with a normal person, uh, it would be a normal situation. Uh, the, you know, you could also ply the king or the successors with women and, and, and concubines and escorts and so on and so forth. And that's, 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 that's important. That's interesting because of the long-term consequences are, are really unclear. In Cambodia, Pol Pot's sister, one of his sisters, was a, was a wife, well, one, of, one of multiple wives or a concubine, I don't know what the proper term is, of the king in Cambodia. So you can see some sort of basis for Pol Pot. Um, not, not, that's not the name he was born with. I don't know why, why they changed it. His name actually is like, starts with an S. So his sister is essentially working for the royalty, but not in probably any significant capacity. And so you know the, the brother probably sees this, and then whether or not that causes some sort of psychological distaste for titles and royalty and education, I don't know. I mean, that, that, but that's something that's not mentioned in, in most history books about Cambodia, but it did happen. I read it in a history book called The History of Cambodia um, and, and so on and so forth. So the, one of the other things you want to think about is you come in and then you want to placate the sultan. You've already got the legal authority that's based on military power. It's more, usually, if you're a European, based on the navy. But how do you, what do you do then? Right? You're stealing the country's natural resources. How do you make it happen in a way that placates the country? Right? And, and the easiest way is you parade the king or the sultan out into the public dressed in high regalia. In some cases, you've got a situation where they've got multiple military titles um, all over. You know, they've got a, a German cross. Um, you know, you're giving gifts back and forth and so on and so forth. And so it looks like you're treating this person very well. You have a palace. You, you, you say this is a representative of you, the people. And, of course, there was no democracy at the time. 
and so <laughs> the people obviously can't replace it, but it's a standing for the people and, and you're treating this person well. And so when something happens, maybe he can give a speech that placates the people or makes promises because he's still got you know, legal authority based on the document. He hasn't given that up. And so they still have power over the judges and over, oh no, so on and so forth. And some, I'm not sure about the taxes, right? In some cases, you're not only stealing the natural resources, but you're also taxing people using local officials. But that's the, no, that's, that's the worst case scenario. But if you look at it from another perspective, there's a lot of interesting artwork in there. And, you know, it's, it's in the form of gifts going back and forth. And that would used to be called tribute, where, you know, a country would just give that to a more, would, every year would give something to a more powerful country. Uh, in order to maintain peaceful relations. But what you really see, if it's done properly, is that the gifts that were given were a, a physical manifestation of the understanding of your, I guess, of your friend's culture. And so your friend might give you a horse or, um, or a, a, a painting of a horse. Uh, if you're Chinese, obviously the lion or the tiger uh, within Asia is, is, is very much you know, prominent. And so you still had to build these things, right? But you had to work together, right? You might have a year or something to build something uh, that would be a, a very monumental gift. And so you still have to work with people. And I'm sure you had, you know, a consortium of artists and sculptors and there's crystal vases, there's crystal vases, crystal plates. One of them has a, a depiction of Mount Fuji. Um, and, you know, you've got all these really interesting things going on uh, that, had to, that had to have involved cultural cross-communication. So in a best case scenario, yes, you're under occupation, but each side takes time to learn about each other. And in, in doing so, creates the groundwork for a long-term relationship that's not based on exploitation. And so you can see how maybe, the, you know, in some cases, perhaps the French may have done very poorly in Cambodia with, with respect to this cross-cultural communication, but they still built the university. A lot of what you see that you think is from that country's, you know, uh, people is actually financed or at least built by the colonial powers. So the university in Phnom Penh is built by the French. That's fairly easy to figure out. You know, you go to the library and it's, it's got a sign that says Bibliothèque or Bibliotheca and so on and so forth. Um, you see all that very quickly. And a lot of, you know, even the Rattan furniture, uh, if you go down, it was actually in, in Indonesia, it was quite popular. It was then commercialized to the mass market. But it, was, but it was actually, I think, the Dutch or the British that came in and actually created it based on, we've got all these natural resources, we can't ship all of it out, we're gonna do some of it, so we're gonna do something with it here and then we're gonna commercialize it. And what we're gonna do is use the king as a, an advertiser, essentially. And not only are we gonna try to treat him well, but we're going to use him as an advertiser so that people who wanna be like the king uh, can go out and buy a piece of his furniture. This again, for the most part, in many cases, not made or invented by the people within the country, but either a collaboration or sometimes just straight up a, the, the, the colonial power bringing in their artists and their sculptors and then trying to figure out what to do with the natural resources uh, within that country in order to, again, create an image of, you know, peace uh, during a, a time of, not, uh, well, there's no other word for it, right? It's just occupation. And so you're in that position where you're trying to figure out what to do. Um, and, you know, again, if it works out very well, you can see how in some cases it may work out. You go to some countries and the buildings are still standing there. Uh, there are obviously a lot of people who intermarried um, and so on and so forth. But, you know, you go back and so you have to think about all these things when you're studying history. You know, what was really happening on the ground floor? Um, it, and what I don't like about the way it's taught is, you know, it really is about power, drugs, women, trade, and, you know, just intelligence. Um, and it's not taught that way. And even though that's really what it's all about. So you come over here, you look at this building that is now in, in hasn't been maintained very well, though, again, the inside is beautiful. And you think, what, what are the stories to people inside here could tell? Um, and a lot of it is going to be about that cross-cultural communication uh, that not enough study has been done on. And that's partly because of the system that's set up, where it's a top-down system, and in many cases, a segregated system. And so you can also see within all of these things a, you know, why you have the rise of the peasant class or the farming class that's usually disconnected. Um, you can see how a lot of the dis you know, discontents come from the rural areas that may have never met the king or have an opportunity or had an opportunity to see the king. And then you've got, again, another situation where my last point is, and a lot of times people would come in 
And the other way they would placate the Sultan or the King is they would bring in their own laborers. And so let's say you come over here uh, to Malaysia, you've already got Malaysians working in the mines, they have the tin, they have palm oil and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different things. And the way you disrupt that normal process is you bring in your, your workers from the empire. So your British empire, you've got access to Indian laborers, uh, Tamil laborers, I'm sure, uh, and, so, and Chinese laborers or from Hong Kong. And so you, br you bring them all in. And now they're competing with the locals. And so inevitably, because there's not enough work to go around, uh, there's either a racial riot or, or some sort of fight that disrupts the operations of the natural resources. Uh, that is the foundation for all that, you know, all the art and the sculptures and so on, that a lot of that is being paid from the receipts of the sales of those things um, and of those upmarket, you know, uh, resource development. And so what you notice at that point is the Sultan is then trapped. You know, he may have an army, but for the most part, it's been supplanted by either not very well trained or it's been supplanted by the, a foreign power. And so he now has to search out this foreign power that's caused a problem, right, by bringing in these, these quote unquote outsiders and essentially pitting, pitting them against the locals. And so the, and, and that's another way that the colonial powers were, colonial powers were able to maintain dominion um, over such long, far away uh, regions as they would essentially create um, this, this, this idea of conflict uh, that, they, that, that they themselves generated um, and then had to be called in by the Sultan to quell. And so if you've got the riots, the Sultan doesn't have an army that's competent. The police might even be the, the Gurkhas by the British. So somebody has to come in and fix this problem, get the mine operational again. And again, you're gonna, who, who, who are you going to call? You're going to call the British, you're going to call the French, you're going to call whatever colonial power is there. Uh, because your your document gives you power over the appointments and, and the the day-to-day the -day administration of things, but not necessarily anything that would be able to handle a lot of different disruptions. So that's the other thing you want to think about when you're studying history, is all these different tactics that are being used that may show up in a headline somewhere in London, you know, racial riots, you know, these people just can't get along, when in fact it's something that's been manufactured specifically in order to force the king to realize his dependence on the foreign power. So again, really interesting stuff. It's not taught this way. It should be taught this way. And then you've got to think about as you're studying all these different places, you know, how it all sort of pieces together uh, today. But of course, you've got segregation rights. So you've got different provinces with different sultans uh, that post you know, colonization have to figure out how to work together, even though they may be, op you know, may have been organized completely differently. You know, one, one may have more natural resources than the other, and now you've got to put them all together under a federalism structure, or that at least something that, that, something that allows the central government some sort of say, um, despite the fact that, of course, the central government was outsourced within that country, colonized country, for quite some time.